So, um, hello everybody, and just uh, one sentence in advance, I see some faces I have seen in the tutorial and in my last uh, talk about OSGI Declarative Services, don't expect anything new. It's uh, basically the same talk or the same information as in the tutorial, just for a different audience. Okay, so just because I had some remarks on the last talk about that. Okay, my name is Dirk Faut, spelled with a hard T, but um, I'm aware that uh, English-speaking people are calling me Mr. Fauf, and they're making jokes of it. Um, what missed was that I'm an active Eclipse uh, committer in various projects like the Eclipse platform itself. That's why I really enjoyed the talk by Alex Blewett about optimizing Eclipse plugins. Thanks uh, for mentioning this talk, Alex. Um, but I don't want to step into too much uh, about my person because the more interesting thing are declarative services. And uh, why do I think declarative services are cool technology? I stepped into that a few months ago when I was rewriting and uh, working on the architecture of one of our OSGI um, applications where we found out that they thought they had a service-oriented system but actually it was not really service oriented. And I dig into the whole technology and found out that OSGI itself is uh, designed to be service oriented by design. So uh, OSGI is service oriented by design. They have this contract, if you're searching for OSGI services, you will find a picture that's similar to this one. Some call it the register, get and listen um, contract. Others call it the publish, bind, find uh, contract. Basically, what it says is that you're, you're providing a service in the middle with a specified contract, and there is one bundle or multiple bundles that are registering a service, and there can be multiple bundles that are receiving the service or consuming the service. So that's, that's the whole thing about services uh, or the service-oriented contract in OSGI. So far, so good. But if you're looking on how to use it, then you will end up using low-level API with a service tracker, the service registry. So you need to know all these things. With the declarative services, you are declaring your services. You don't need to know the underlying base layer in the end as a user of the services. Now, I try to search for information to get more familiar with OSGI declarative services and actually I wasn't able to find a lot of information in the web. It got better with Enroute. I'm seeing people here that are contributing to Enroute and um, I really got a lot of information from there. But it's also not complete yet. So I ended up in reading the specification. And by doing this I realized, okay, Probably I need to do some talks, writing blog posts and tutorials to teach that technology more so more people are getting used to it, even in the Eclipse world where, where I'm coming from. The first thing I realized is that there are a lot of terms in the specification and it's hard to follow these terms. It starts with a service component. Because in decorative services, you're first talking about components and they are not automatically a service, although the specification is called declarative services. Why that is that this way, I will come up shortly when we are looking on how to, how to specify or how to define such a component. But what is a component, and in the end a component, is a Java class that is annotated. No, uh, well, the annotation comes later. First thing is, it's a Java class, and it's declared by a component description. So to have an OSGI component, you have these two uh, artifacts. Now what is a component description? This is where it first got scary. It's an XML document to declare a component, uh, a service component. Okay, you need to write XML. That was my first opinion, like, oh, do I really want to write XML nowadays? I don't. But the specification is very nice, so you don't have to do it manually anymore. Now, the third uh, definition we find is, or the third term, it's the component configuration. Now, the component configuration is basically a component description. 
so the XML document. That is parameterized with component properties that you can change dynamically or specify statically. And the component configuration tracks the component dependencies and manages the component instances. And now what's a component instance? Well, that's in the end the Java, the object instance of the component implementation class. It's created when the configuration gets activated. We will come to this point why, and why this is important uh, in the life cycle. And it's also discarded when the configuration is deactivated. I'll get back to this when, when I'm talking about the life cycle. The next terms were the references. So a reference is a definition of the dependency to another service. And there we are really talking about service. You cannot reference a component automatically. And then there are two, two terms that were confusing me in the beginning. The target service and the bound service. So the target service, if you're making a picture, maybe the full, full slide. So the target service is the service that matches the reference interface. So you're on, on, the, on a definition level where the service component runtime is able to see if everything matches. And bound service is when we're actually binding the two um, component configurations. So the service component runtime knows what, what belongs to each other. The fourth uh, topic here, the access strategies, they are with the DS spec 1.3, there are three um, access strategies for accessing the services, which are the event strategy, the lookup strategy, and with DS 1.3, the field strategy. I will also cover that in more detail in a few minutes, just to have the, the terms heard. And now, regarding the activation, we have these three types of components. We have the delayed component, which means it is activated when the service is uh, accessed the first time. The picture of the life cycle will make this more clear why this is important. Um, actually, using delayed components will um, increase your startup time and lower the, the memory footprint on startup because you're delaying everything. You can also have immediate components and I learned that you typically use immediate components in a plain OSGI application as your main class. So it started automatically and then you're doing something with it. There are for sure also other use cases to immediately start a service for setups in the background, initializations and all that stuff. And well, the, the big thing is here, they are activated as soon as everything is ready to play. And the third thing are the factory components. From the use cases I have played around with, it looked like factory components are not used very often. So I don't want to talk about factory components in this talk for getting started. It looked a bit more complicated in, in the whole uh, composition. So life cycle. Now this is the, the, the interesting sheet here, or the interesting picture. I mainly redraw it from the specification. But what uh, uh, this says here for the immediate component is that after the bundle is started, this XML file, the component configuration, is loaded by the SER. And after it's started, or after it is loaded, it is checked if your component is enabled. You have the chance to configure that on startup, you will not enable it automatically. This gives you the chance to delay even the enablement uh, at a later time, so you can programmatically enable your components. Um, if it's enabled, it moves into the unsatisfied state. That means it is checked if all the references can be satisfied. So. If I um, configured that I reference other services, are these services available? If they're not yet available, I will not be satisfied, so I will not start. Compared to what Alex said in his talk regarding activators, now an activator will be executed when the bundle is started. Correct me? No, you don't correct me, that's good. Um, so every code there will be executed when the bundle is started. Now, and for some 
cases, you don't want that. For example, loading resources. We only need the resources like images when they're actually needed. Having this in place, uh, well, for the immediate component, that's, that's a stupid example, I'm sorry. It's my more sense for the delayed component, but it will check if all the other services are in place so we don't have uh, to rely on the startup order. That's what I'm, uh, I actually wanted to say. And it's on a different thread, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, on a different thread, not the main thread, we're on the SER thread. And uh, the second thing is we don't need to take care of the startup order like we're doing in most of our Eclipse RCP applications where you end up in configuring which bundle starts at which state in which order. You don't have to do this if you configure your dependencies here correctly. Now, if everything is satisfied, and to satisfy a component, also the configuration comes to place if you need one, but um, I'm not talking about configuration here, it becomes active. So immediately the active method is called, the activate method is called. It stays in the active state unless it's deactivated. For example, dynamically someone shuts down a referenced service, so my component is not satisfied anymore, then it also is deactivated and uh, discarded. This was the slide I was referring to a few minutes ago. Um, with a delayed component, our, uh, we're not moving from the unsatisfied state to the activate state automatically. It will first come to the registered state. So the service component runtime will tell you or will say, I have that service. I can start, it can be started. Uh, I have everything in place to work. But as long as nobody asks me to do something, as, no, as long as nobody requested me, I will, not be, I will not be activated. I will stay in a registered state unless somebody calls me. This, uh, well, and the rest is if the services, if all service references are removed and or it becomes unsatisfied, we have the life cycle like before. Now, why is this thing uh, a big improvement compared to doing things in an activator or probably doing things immediately? That's the activation process. I copied these topics from the specification because I didn't find any better uh, explanation for it. The activation is that what costs time and memory. So the activation, when the component is and a delayed act, or when the component itself is activated. We are actually loading the component implementation class. So this is when the class loading happens. If you don't activate it, you don't have the class loading that is running. It will create the component instance and the corresponding component context. So this is when really something happens. It will bind all the target services and dependent on how you specify your references, this also means all the reference services are loaded and activated and so on, the whole chain down. And then the activate method will be called if it's present. That means for delayed components, the load time is moved to the first request of the service, including all the reference service bindings. That means we save startup time and the initial memory footprint if we use delayed components. And this is done by the service component runtime. I don't have to do anything additionally to um, benefit from this behavior, from delayed loading. Just for the completeness, completeness, this is how it looks like for a component factory where, you, where your factory is getting satisfied and if you request a service, it gets activated. It creates a new instance that gets discarded afterwards. With DS 1.3, we have the prototype scope. So from my understanding, this more and more leads to the fact that the component factory is not very common or, or useful anymore. I think there probably might be still one or two use cases, but I haven't found any in, on the web. So how did you implement and publish a service? We have seen the picture from before, with the, we have the service contract in the middle and then the, the publisher and the consumer. So the service contract is the service API. We're, we're still in Java, so we are writing an API, which is an interface which we can share across instances. I had a discussion a few months ago where somebody said, oh, why do we need 
interfaces. That's so old school. We want to use POJOs. Everything is so fine and happy. We don't need to restrict ourselves on interfaces. Well, we, are, we want to um, share what's common. And typically, what we want to do is we want to make the service implementation exchangeable. How do I want to ex make a service implementation exchangeable without a common interface that I rely on? So that's the one thing. The second thing is the clean dependency hierarchy. And I have a, I always like this presentation uh, or this, this uh, animation. And the ones who have seen it already will probably smile. This is one of the examples, or this is one example of one of my experiences in, in my projects. I have an, a common error handler. So there is one bundle that has an error handler interface and a concrete implementation. Now, how does such an implementation look like in the RCP world? Well, we are opening a dialogue, an error dialogue with SWT. If I don't take care about my package exports and everything, this means my bundle, my error handler, is dependent on SWT. That means, sorry, the wrong. If, uh, if my consumer bundle that wants to use the error handler is transitively dependent to SWT. So I cannot take my consumer bundle with the error handler in general and deploy it on something else that doesn't use SWT. Therefore, I suggest to split it like this. So we have one API bundle where only the API is defined. The consumer is dependent on the API. And I have an implementation that is dependent on SWT. So I remove this, uh, this transitive dependency to the widget toolkit. I have a runtime dependency for sure, but it's not. I can exchange it. How does uh, the definition of the service API look like? Uh, it's always the wrong direction, so here. This is the BND tool screenshot. In the PDE tools talk, I showed uh, PDE. Well, um, if you're using BND tools, it's very easy. You're specifying your metadata in a .BND file, and the manifest is generated for you. In our case, that's, um, it's an API project, so there is nothing really happening. Yeah? You, you only need to specify the package that you need to export. That's what, where your API is contained. Um, so in your manifest, you, well, you're creating the .bnd file. You describe your metadata in that .bnd file, and the manifest is generated. Again, for my Eclipse friends here, the manifest is written programmatically. I need to specify every bit myself. That's the good thing about BND tools. It, it simply does the right thing, and it generates a valid manifest file without the issues we have in Eclipse RCP. That's it for the API. I think that's nothing, uh, not, nothing special. So the next thing is uh, the service provider. So as shown in the previous animation, we create a new bundle with an app, with the implementation. Now, that's pretty easy. We, we implement the interface and we add one simple annotation on it, on top of it. If there is no annotation support, you need to program at, uh, to write the XML file with a whole definition. And PDE had a very bad uh, editor for this, the component definition editor. Can't say it often enough. It, it generated invalid XML. That's why I'm, I'm really a, a, I hate that editor. But with that annotation, we will get the XML, the component definition, generated. Well, in BND tools, we have to do two things. We need to specify that we want to use declarative services. There are actually two types. There are the BND tools, uh, or the BND annotations, and the OSGIDS annotations. From what I have read, the OSGIDS annotations in its current state are derived from the BND annotations. So for me, there is no use case to use BND annotations anymore. Use the, use the specification ones, and then it runs on every, uh, on every platform. So you, you don't have any issues here. Well, again, we add API to the bundle path. Or we don't see it here. And you select the annotations to be used. You actually don't export your implementation bundle. 
nobody should, uh, you don't want that somebody sees your implementation. You only want to, people should use the interface, the contract. So what does the add component um, annotation actually do? Well, it first marks a Java class as a service component. So if you look in this, to the source code, well, that marking, hmm, the add component or all the S annotations are compile time annotations or build time annotations. So at runtime, they are not inspected. So the first sentence is more like, if you look into the code, you will see that it's a DS annotation. It has no effect at runtime. Because at build time, it does generate the component description XML file for you. In BMD tools, this is directly packaged into the, into the resulting jar. Um, and it also adds additional header in the manifest file, like the service component header, where you specify that I have an XML file. Dear service component runtime, I have here a component configuration. Please load it. And it adds the provide capability header for OSGI service. So it adds the capability header to say, I provide a service. And if we are using DS 1.3 features, uh, like component property types, I will shortly, shortly explain. Then it will also add the require capability header to specify, dear runtime, I need a DS in specification 1.3, and if that's not available, I cannot start. For those who are not uh, aware of capabilities, I learned that recently, so um, I wanted to have this on a short slide. What are capabilities? A capability is a non-code dependency. For all who haven't used that before, typically you specify your bundle dependencies on a package level. So you export a package, you import a package, so everything is on code level. With a capability, you can also specify non-code dependencies, like we did here uh, before with uh, require capability on the OSGI extender. Uh, I have here an example that's better. So OSGI extender, well, that's the extender pattern. Don't want to get too, uh, too much into detail that, but we're actually saying with this uh, filter string that we have a requirement that an um, extender, the service component runtime in version 1.3 starts, or is, is available. It was added in the spec with DS 1.3. Last year at EclipseCon, Something, some similar information was shown to Eclipse developers, which led the, to adding the extender, OSGI extender capability to Equinox DS, which is currently in specification 1.2. So for us as Eclipse developers, we are able to specify the require capability also for 1.2. For us as Eclipse developers, this is nice. If we ever want to deploy one of these bundles to another service component runtime, like Felix in version 1.2, our bundle won't start up anymore because it's only spec'd in 1.3. Yeah, but still, I think it's a good addition for for Eclipse at this point. Um, so, just want to mention it here. And well, we are providing an OSGI service with the object class inverter string inverter. So others. Uh, well, that's the type of our service. So we can even specify in our bundles that we need a service of this type to start up. So on startup, we can even check if our bundle should be started, if it's satisfied. Not only on the component level, we can um, check this before. That component annotation has several parameters where you can configure how the component should be registered. The first two are about configuration. As I said, I'm not able to get this in a getting started tutorial uh, or in a getting started talk, so yeah. These are the two attributes for, uh, that are relevant for configuration. You can specify whether your component should be enabled or not uh, on startup. You can specify if it's a factory. Now, the more interesting thing is immediate in combination with the service parameter. At component, oh, really? Come on. <laughs> <sighs> we can do questions afterwards. <laughs> okay, then I have 10 minutes. <sighs> okay, that's good. <sighs> okay, immediate and service. Um, the default is actually um, 
tricky because you need to implement an interface directly, then it's getting a service which becomes a delayed component. That's the default if you don't specify anything more. If you don't implement an interface, it will not make your component an, a service, then it will become an immediate component by default. If you specify no, uh, if you don't implement an interface directly, but you add the service property, it will be again a service uh, that is a delayed component. It took a while to understand these defaults, but uh, well. So we, we can specify our configuration properties and uh, well, with 1.3 the service factory attribute was deprecated and replaced with the scope. Um, so you can say whether it, want, it should be a singleton, which is the default. There's only one instance of my service. It's a bundle scope, so every bundle gets its own instance or a prototype scope, so every requester gets its own instance. The next uh, annotations are the lifecycle annotations. So you can register methods that, are, that react on, on lifecycle events of your component. So when it's activated, it's deactivated, or in configuration when it's modified. For me, the interesting thing was what are the method parameters? Because that's not documented anywhere else than the specification. At least I haven't found much information about that. So these are the three possible um, parameters and you can skip, change, remove them like you want. What's the interesting thing in 1.3? Now here you get your component properties from the configuration. This is, uh, well, for me it's kind of an untyped map because it's a map string object and the value of my property needs to be determined at, at runtime. With DS 1.3 we have component property types which gives us a type safe access to the configuration properties. Up to the consumer. Well, here we see that's now a service component because I added the service property. Actually, I'm implementing here uh, an Apache Go Go shell command. This is done by adding these two properties on top, configuration properties, but the important thing for the consum consummation is add reference. So with this I specify that I have a reference to string inverter, so my command will only start up if, a, if that inverter is in place. So with add reference I'm specifying a dependency on other services. It is required to satisfy a component, at least if it's not optional. And we have the different access strategies. So, access strategies, the first one is the event strategy. That's the most common one until DS 1.2, uh, unless 1.3. So all Eclipse developers are currently forced to use this. You have a bind method that's required. That's where the add reference stands. We have an unbind method that's only necessary in case it's a dynamic reference and updated is for, um, well, for configuration changes. Also here, what are the possible method parameters? It's service reference, service type, or a combination of the service type and my properties. With DS 1.3, we have additional parameters, uh, the component service object, and with DS 1.3, we are forced to have these three types of parameter lists with DS 1.3 we can mix them or change them or we can, for example, also only get the configuration object or the component property type. No, not the component property type because that's not on add reference. Um, you can get the configuration property solely in the bind method because you can combine it with a field strategy. That was added with 1.3, which means we can well, it looks like field injection, if you're aware of injection, um, uh, of dependency injection in Java. Actually, I had some discussions. OSGIDS is not doing dependency injection. Sometimes people are telling this, but it, for me it's not dependency injection because that annotation specifies an XML file. Ah, okay, there we are. It specifies the XML file and the, serv the service component runtime injects the value, okay. 
but it's an XML-based um, dependency injection and not like uh, in Eclipse, the, the object-based uh, dependency injection where you, where you have a runtime annotation that's inspected. That's the difference. I, I have seen the skeptical um, the faces. The net effect is more or less the same, right? Hmm? The net effect is more or less the same. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, despite the fact that it's not runtime. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I agree. <laughs> said something wrong. Okay, time is running out, so uh, I need to hurry up. Lookup strategy, um, you get the service reference injected, and then you, um, when you actually need the service, you're looking it up. This looks like in DS 1.3, well, this is the OSGI track, so let's look how it looks in DS 1.2, uh, this is DS 1.3. Um, you have additionally the reference attribute on add, add component and then that lookup looks shorter, it's, it's more compact. Why do you want to use the lookup strategy? Well, this is, um, if we, are, we looked at the life cycle, now my component is activated, so we have reference.